From WBUR Boston, I'm Tom Ashbrook, and this is On Point. Super Babies Out of China was the big web buzz last week. Genius babies, genetically engineered and boosting a whole country's IQ. It was all over the Internet, and it was overblown. But is China studying the genetics of intelligence? Yes, definitely. Are Chinese and American scientists looking to craft better babies in the test tube? Yes, certainly. Is sex on the way out as the way we reproduce? Maybe. This hour on point, super babies. You can join the conversation, what's okay here by you? What's not? Will old-fashioned sex for babies soon look primitive, careless, What would you do genetically to give your child an edge? You can comment at our website, onpointradio.org, or on Twitter and Facebook at On Point Radio. With us first today, a man from the heart of last week's web storm, Vice.com, the digital news site of the arts and culture magazine Vice, reported last week that BGI, China's genetic giant, is engineering genius babies. Dr. Steve Shu is part of the core team at BGI's Cognitive Genomics Lab. He's also VP for Research and Graduate Studies and a professor of theoretical physics at Michigan State. He joins us from East Lansing. Steve Shu, welcome to On Point. Hi, Tom. Great to be on the program. What kind of research is BGI doing on human intelligence and genetics, Steve? Well, BGI is a large private company in China that's one of the leading genomics labs in the world. We're currently conducting what's called a genome-wide association study in which we look at associations, statistical associations, between high intelligence and certain uh, aspects of the genome. Uh, So here we are. The story comes out. They've talked to somebody here in America who says that you are collecting genetic material from 2,000 of the smartest people in the world and that you're getting ready to identify the parts of that genetic material that determine intelligence and with that, engineer a much more intelligent Chinese population, zillions of super smart Chinese babies, raise the IQ maybe one day of all of China by 5%. What about it? The first two points you mentioned are correct. The third point is a huge speculative leap. And uh, I should add that uh, nobody in our lab is currently involved with any kind of reproductive or genetic engineering uh, technologies. So, you're, But you are looking to understand how and where in our what genetic sequence we, uh, intelligence is based, uh, represented? What's that challenge look like? So the, the fundamental motivation here is science. And uh, we all know the brain is one of the most complex objects in the entire universe. Um, but a lot of people are surprised that the brain is actually built from a very small program. Only about th- a few gigabits of genetic code are able to construct your brain the secrets of how that is actually done and what makes humans, for example, much smarter than animals, um, those are open questions and those are the scientific questions we're trying to answer. Uh, is it possible or is it so? Is intelligence such a complex thing and not just genetic but environmental? Do you think it's possible to sort of isolate the elements of the human uh, g- genetic sequence that determine intelligence and um, select for those or one day positively engineer them? If you take two identical twins that have the same uh, genomic information and you raise them in separate families, perhaps families with very different environments and parenting strategies, you'll typically find very small differences in intelligence between those twins. Studies of that sort and with very large uh, statistics uh, imply to us that a very big chunk of variation in IQ or intelligence is controlled by genes. Um, now, you say that BGI is not involved in reproduction, but on, on your BGI Shenzhen, uh, Shenzhen website, uh, you're talking about the project for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and screening and making some big claims and promising some big things there. You know, this is, I guess, familiar to people from, uh, from to most people if they know about it, it's from uh, in vitro fertilization, uh, where you've got uh, eggs that are drawn from a, a mother, you've got sperm from a father, you get a bunch of uh, zygotes going, little uh, just a few cells that, that could develop into uh, an embryo. You can look at those and get a sense of the genetic profile of each, and I guess maybe select from those the, the one you want to take to term, the one you want to take all the way to uh, the bouncing baby. So what are you doing on that front? 
So let me clarify. BGI has thousands of employees. It's quite a big lab. Um, Our particular lab, the Cognitive Genomics Lab, is interested in basic science. There are other units within the company that are doing things which involve reproduction, including uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Um, Well, that sounds like a big deal. I mean, they're certainly making big claims here. They're saying, you know, first in the world and this and that front offers a complex package to overcome all kinds of problems and exploit fully the enormous possibilities of this. It says, um, you know, you'll have access to the most sophisticated sample analysis method, method with amazing future possibilities. Like what? Well, um, the current technology allows to genotype a fertilized egg. And what do you mean decisions. by that? Understand what its genetic profile is? Is that what that means? Potentially to read out the entire genetic sequence, the whole genome sequence of that fertilized embryo. Mm-hmm. And so if you had multiple fertilized embryos here, you could then, I I guess the idea here is that you would choose the one with the most promising characteristics. Yes. Currently, it's already the case that people screen against known genetic diseases. Mm -hmm. And in the future, people might screen positively for certain quantities that they desire in the child. Like what? Well... Uh, height, intelligence, certain per- personality characteristics. Some people might screen for eye color, hair color. Uh, so this, I mean, uh, there's been a lot of criticism of the Vice.com story saying they, they went too far, they got it wrong. But that's kind of what they were talking about. They were saying, you know, this this is what's in the works here. Maybe they were right, Dr. Shu. I think that uh, these types of activities that are described in the Vice article will be possible at some point in time. They're not currently possible. Uh, Of course, I guess people think about the future all the time, and uh, advances are being made in a hurry. BGI's own website uh, has a lot to say about that and seems very encouraging about it. You call BGI a private company, and certainly there's private money invested in it, but it is also described as a state agency with, with a huge amount of public Chinese state money in it. So is there a national agenda on the genetics front that is pursued by BGI? Well, let me clarify. So it is a privately held company. It receives government grants in the same way that an American company might receive government grants to perform certain types of research. Um, Is there a, at the national level, is there a Chinese agenda to uh, engage in these kinds of activities? I would say no, actually. Um, We have a very limited amount of funding and we're actually quite constrained by our budget. So uh, I would love it if there were more support from any government in this, uh, toward this kind of research, but it's not current. 1.5 billion over the next 10 years I'm reading here. That doesn't sound so small. And and I'm reading, and this could be wrong, but the the Wikipedia entry, who knows, but BGI Shenzhen was officially recognized as a state agency in 2008, it says. So they have uh, an, a loan from, I believe it's the Chinese Bank of Development, mm-hmm. although I'm not completely sure. And it's, a, it's sort of a line of credit, which is quite large, something like $1.5 billion. Mm-hmm. Um, it, is, it is not actually an arm of the Chinese government, however. Um, you know, th- this is a big deal when it comes to the, the diseases that people can face and can be um, what worked a- against by this kind of genetic screening. Do you think it's going to be important for individual families, individuals when they're looking at having kids, for whole populations, whole countries, in maybe right now, but certainly in the future, to look at the profile of what's coming and do their best to enhance it? Is, is that where we're headed, Dr. Shu? Well, let me say that I'm fairly certain uh, that in the foreseeable future, these types of activities will be technologically possible. So then we have to think about uh, whether we as a society uh, want to embrace these things, want to outlaw these things. Um, and the first step in that is to understand really what the uh, scientific aspects of the problem are. You know, to do this screening, you, you, you can't do it if you reproduce the old-fashioned way, just through natural sex, because you won't have this selection of fertilized embryos or zygotes that you can then profile and, and choose the most promising one from. Does that make you, I mean, is sex on the way out here? I doubt it because most people enjoy it quite a bit. But maybe it just becomes recreational and not procreative. That's possible. Um, can you imagine a time when a significant portion of some society, China or the U.S. or other, uh, is reproducing 
in the test tube in order to have more control over the genetic quality, if that's the right word, of the offspring. I think it's very possible. And actually, unfortunately, what we'll probably live through first is a period where only wealthy people have the option to do it. How close is that? It depends on what trait you want to select on. Uh, For traits like intelligence, I would say we're probably a decade away. So in 10 years, I might be able to go through a process by which I enhance my child's intelligence by a significant percentage? So I think to be precise, what would happen is that uh, you and your wife would, or partner would conceive some number of uh, fertilized uh, embryos. In vitro. And mm-hmm. in, vi- in vitro. And uh, you would do uh, genotyping of those. And there would be predictions coming out of a computer model mm-hmm. uh, for which of those, what the traits would be like for each of those uh, fertilized embryos. And you would make a selection as to which one you wanted to actually um, have implanted. Amazing. So we'll kind of look in the little carton of eggs and say, we, yeah, we'll take the, I don't know, the brunette one or the smart one or the tall one or or all three if it came out that way. That's correct. I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point. We're talking this hour about the engineering genius babies story out of China. What's real, what's not, and what's coming here? Of course, this is the kind of thing that... um, Science fiction has thought about for a long time. Talk about Brave New World, all this Huxley, Huxley, all the way back in 1932. This was exactly the premise of his story, more or less, sort of conveyor belts with uh, going through a factory with lots of little hatchlings in them. Of course, the way those were sorted into a caste system in that imagined society got people pretty riled up at the time. Science has come a long way on the genetics front, and we're looking at exactly what's going on here and what's coming. Uh, Here's a little sound from 1997 sci-fi film Gattaca set in the not-too-distant future. Designer babies have become the norm. Here, two parents, played by Elias uh, Koteas and Jane Brooke, meet with a doctor, played by Blair Underwood, to design their second child after having their first, Vincent, the traditional way. I have taken the liberty of eradicating any potentially prejudicial conditions, uh, premature baldness, myopia, alcoholism and addictive susceptibility, uh, propensity for violence, obesity, etc. We didn't want, I mean, diseases, yes, but... Uh... Right. We were just wondering if, if it's good to just leave a few things to, to chance. You want to give your child the best possible start. Believe me, we have enough imperfection built in already. No, your child doesn't need any additional burdens. And keep in mind, this child is still you, simply the best of you. You could conceive naturally a thousand times and never get such a result. Don't leave it to chance. Get the best of you, simply the best of you. And that, it looks like, may very, very well be on its way. Dr. Steve Shu is with us from East Lansing, Michigan. He's part of the core team at BGI's Cognitive Genomics Lab in China. Very, very big genetics operation there. One of the biggest, maybe the biggest in the world. Also with us right now from New York is Lee Silver, professor of molecular biology and public affairs at Princeton University, founder and principal science advisor of Gene Peaks. It's a company that helps people interpret their own genetic information to reduce the risk of heritable diseases. And he's author of Remaking Eden, How Genetic Engineering and Cloning Will Transform the American Family. Lee Silver, welcome to One Point. Great to have you here. Hi, Tom. Great to be here. And with us from Durham, North Carolina, is Nita Farinay, professor of law, philosophy, genome science, and policy at Duke University School of Law. She's a member of the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues, studies the ethical, legal, and social implications of biosciences and emerging technologies. Nita, welcome to One Point. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Tom. Lee, you uh, may have seen the big buzz around this uh, story on the web last week, and Is this where we're headed? Uh, Draw some distinctions here between what's up on the rails and happening and what maybe is not, and where where are we going, Lee? Sure. Well, uh, let's keep in mind that um, there are two very different kinds of ways in which people can choose the genes that uh, that are uh, in their put into their children. One is called PGD, which is selecting among. Uh, a group of embryos to pre-implantation implant. genetic diagnosis, the right. kind of genotyping Dr. Shu was that, talking about. 
Right, embryo selection. Mm-hmm. And then a very different category of techniques um, I would call human genome editing. Typically, it's called genetic engineering. And that is actually altering the DNA um, of, the, of the embryo. Now, PGD um, is limited. Um, first of all, the child born by PGD is one that might have been born without any intervention. So mm-hmm. there's nothing actually done to the embryo other than to select it from a, from a group of embryos. Mm-hmm. But I think it's very important to keep in mind the, the fundamental limitations of PGD. First, if a parents don't uh, carry a particular gene, then none of their embryos will either. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you have two people who are both, uh, if they're both blue-eyed, let's say, um, all their children will be blue-eyed. Uh, a second, and this is a really important um, uh, consideration to keep in mind, is the mathematics the mathematics of uh, gene transfer from parents to children. If you wanted to select just 10 uh, genes from the father in the sperm, uh, for example, uh, there's only one, you, you only expect to see that in one out of a thousand sperm, 10 mm-hmm. genes. Mm-hmm. And from the mother, if you're selecting 10 genes, it's also one in a thousand eggs. You put that together uh, and just selecting 10 genes from the mother and from the father, you're only going to find that combination in one embryo out of a million. So that really limits. I mean, it's a fundamental numbers game. It's not a technological uh, thing. It really limits what parents will be able to do in terms of selecting their uh, embryos. So that's a super long shot if you're just creating a bunch of embryos, zygotes, and then choosing the one uh, with the traits you want to get exactly what you want. I, I see what a mathematical long shot that is. That may explain why people are looking at doing this other thing. You call it human genetic editing or genetic engineering. Uh, you know, BGI is doing a lot of research on human intelligence. I mean, they've already sequenced genomes for rice and cucumber and soybeans and honeybees and giant pandas, and they're looking to do it for Bengal tigers and snow leopards. We've got, you know, the human sequence out there. Dr. Shu says it ought to be possible to isolate to recognize the, the, the parts of the genetic sequence that have to do with intelligence, which raises all kinds of opportunities, possibilities there. What do you say to that, Lee? Well, I think, uh, I think he's right on the first point. Um, the uh, genetic technology explosion will allow us to find the genes involved uh, not, too, in, not too much in the, in, the, in the future associated with all of these complex traits that we never thought we would get at. But there's a big jump going from understanding and being able to say this gene has this effect, this combination of genes has this effect, and then using that information to engineer an embryo. It's a huge jump between the first and the second. I mean, it's the same thing that um, pharmaceutical companies have dealt with when they've used the human genome data. It's, it's very easy, especially for a simple disease, to find out what gene causes the disease. Now you know what gene causes the disease. It's pretty hard to use that to develop a therapy um, to prevent the disease. And I should also say that, I mean, the main use of PGD, which, uh, which is already being used um, uh, extensively, is to avoid the transmission of disease genes into the child. In other words, to avoid disease, avoid deleterious mm-hmm. conditions. Like what? Um, you can often, uh, there are cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia. Those, mm-hmm. those are simple ones. Mm-hmm. Um, you get into slightly more complex ones like uh, juvenile diabetes. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a very, very long list of diseases, most of which are pretty rare, but together they're, they're not rare. And um, if you know the genomes of the mother and the father, the first thing you're going to want to do, the first thing they're going to want to do mm-hmm. is to make sure their child doesn't get a genome which is disease-causing. Steve Shu, Dr. Shu, that's very important for families who, who want to screen for that, who have good reason to screen for that. One can easily imagine that, though not everyone will do it. But what about the the longer-term picture here? Can you foresee a time when we understand the elements of our genetic code well enough that we can sort of pick up the bits that may determine intelligence and uh, engineer them into an embryo to actively engineer, actively enhance intelligence, not just choosing one, you know, not just genotyping, but actively 
uh, what, what uh, Dr. Silver calls doing human genetic editing, actively doing it. Genetic editing requires uh, big technological leaps beyond where we are today. But uh, going back to embryo selection, I just want to point out that within ordinary families, there's quite a big uh, distribution in terms of traits like height and intelligence. So you might have a child that is 15 or 20 IQ points um, more or less intelligent than his or her sibling. Mm -hmm. And if you have any ability at all to read the genome on the embryo and then make a prediction, a statistical prediction about which ones are more likely to be at the high end of what is possible for those two parents, you're still giving a big advantage to that couple. If they can choose the one uh, out, of, out of that uh, tray of, of eggs which would uh, or embryos well, that would have the highest IQ or whatever it is they're looking for? For example, so if, you, if, if a man and woman could have, say, 100 children, those children would be distributed uh, mm-hmm. according to what's called a normal distribution. Yeah. And there's, there's quite a big range of possible outcomes. We all know families where one sibling is really tall and the other one's quite a bit shorter. And what the technology for embryo selection lets you do is to choose the particular subset of, say, the 100 fertilized eggs that give you the kid that you actually want. Nita Farhani? I, I think that's a little bit... I mean, the, the problem is, is that there's, there are many different... Um, conditions or or uh, attributes that parents are going to want to choose, and um, they're not going to be able to find them all within the twenty or twenty five embryos that are produced at best from uh, uh, PGD technology. So that you know, after they get over uh, making sure the kid doesn't have uh, a propensity to heart disease and diabetes and all of these other common diseases, there. Uh, they'll be lucky if they find one embryo in 20 that uh, uh, is, uh, has all the health advantages that they want their child to have. Well, maybe not just, all, but what do you imagine, say, Steve? Just imagine that you could peek into 20 alternate universes where the couple had child one, child two, child three, mm-hmm. and, and they just got to choose which of those universes they wanted to live in. I think that's a very economically valuable thing. I think people would pay a lot of money for that. Steve Shu, Lee Silver, stand by. I have to say this is straight up blowing my mind, though maybe it shouldn't. Here's where we are. Here's where the science is. Nita Farhani, you're the, our ethicist here. What about this? I mean, you know, most people all over the world, vastly uh, far and away, are, you know, just doing it the old-fashioned way, and a baby is born, and they get what they get. And we're uh, different pictures being painted here. Of lots of choice, it will be costly at first, but maybe ultimately one day becoming, I don't know, even standard. Can you imagine a world like that? Nita, is it a good idea? So those are a lot of questions at once, Mm -hmm. Tom. Let me first say uh, that the standard way people are doing things already includes selection. We already choose the people who— We choose our partner, but then we go to bed. Well, <laughs> we choose our partner, then, then we go to bed, but we choose our partner in part based on, you know, their traits. Uh, we also choose to do things that enhance our children through development. Now, of course, this is a different step, which is uh, to do selection. And then the next step beyond that is, can you do any sort of editing? With respect to selection, um, I, you know, it's already happening. So can I imagine that we're going to have even more information that parents will have to make decisions in the selection process? Absolutely. Uh, is that troubling or problematic? I think what the Vice article raised, which was particularly troubling, is thinking about selection in the hands of a government instead of in the hands of individuals. So if we imagine state-sponsored reproductive selection, it's a very different thing than giving individual couples the ability to choose uh, which of the embryos has the strongest possible set of traits that are health promoting, um, that uh, even beyond health promotion, enhance a particular trait that they have or selects for a particular trait they have. Though, though, take government out of it for a moment, just leave it to personal choices or, you know, in the United States, we might ultimately call that market choices. And if you get enough people doing this, you could have something rather similar in in its outcome. I mean, can you picture a time where this is so, and this is not a, a small deal. You've got to go in and harvest eggs from the mother and you know, and then you're putting them in a test tube with sperm from the father. But can you imagine a time when sexual reproduction in the, the old fashioned way uh, is seen as backward or primitive or t- too risky and where a significant portion of any given society or part of that society are reproducing test tube wise in order, in order to avoid the kind of heart disease propensity or, you know, uh, sickle cell anemia, whatever it may be. Could, could that become commonplace, Nita? 
I think we'd have to make some serious technological advances before that would become commonplace. So as you say, it is quite invasive for a woman to go in and go through the process of actually having egg extraction. But there's other technological advances that could make it more likely, like, for example, the ability to take a skin cell, induce it into a pluripotent stem cell that then produces and creates egg cells. So if you're able to do something simple, like take a skin biopsy from me um, and use that skin biopsy to create hundreds of eggs, and those hundreds of eggs could be fertilized with my partner's sperm. And then I actually had the option with mathematical and genetic readouts from each and every one of those hundreds to choose the one that has the best possible combination of genes. Sure, I could imagine it under that scenario, and I could imagine if it was simple, cost efficient, um, and led to much better outcomes and results, that that would be something possible. But right now where we are is it's quite invasive. The type of information that you can obtain reliably is not that high. And so I think it'll be a while technologically before we get there. But, if we yeah, could get yeah, there, yeah. should we do it? Right? I mean, should we worry about yeah. individuals making choices and what society would look like? There are some reasons to be concerned. We, if you know, if it's uh, if if you take just the analogy of uh, the the children who are now on ADHD drugs and the number of people who now feel like they have to put their children on ADHD drugs in order to compete with other children, even if they don't have attention deficit disorder, um, that tells you that new norms can shift what people think they have to do in order to keep up. And so the Gattaca story where in order to keep up, you have to enhance your child and you have to select for particular traits, that's possible. It's possible that selective pressure in society could get us to the point where in order to have competitive children, you have to select for the best possible combination of traits um, and what society thinks is the best possible combination of traits in order to compete. Lee, would we be better off in that kind of world than letting nature roll the dice? Well, first of all, as as Nita said, and I agree, we already select our mates. I mean, all animals um, um, select mate. Usually it's the female choosing the male. Yeah, we know that one well, yeah, but but this is a big step. (laughs) Right. And then once we do that, let's remember the numbers. It's, it's, um, you know, to select 10 genes from a mother uh, that are – that are heterozygous in the mother and 10 from the father, that's one in a million embryos. So I think that um, at least in the foreseeable future, um, parents are going to be limited. They're going to have to make choices. But you've I, said nature is cruel. Nature is nature's rough. Very we we cruel. may be better off on this path. Yes. I said uh, ma- uh, nature, uh, mother, mother nature is a nasty I have no problem with um, um, parents um, selecting embryos to to avoid deleterious conditions, and 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 as you said, nature is very very cruel, which is why I think that what people will want to do is to choose the embryo that's the healthiest, the embryo that's least likely to get uh, any of the hundreds thousands of uh, diseases that uh, afflict us as we get older. Tom Ashbrook, this is On Point. We're talking this hour about the engineering genius babies story out of China. What's real? What's not? What's coming here? And I mean right here, maybe everywhere. It is a pretty incredible frontier of science, and it is unfolding right in front of us. Dr. Steve Shu is with us from East Lansing, Michigan. He's VP of Research and Graduate Studies at Michigan State University. He's also part of the core team at BGI, BGI's Cognitive Genomics Lab in China, where they have big ambitions when it comes to human intelligence and our genetic sequence and much more. Lee Silver is with us from Princeton University, professor of molecular biology and public affairs there, author of Remaking Eden, How Genetic Engineering and Cloning Will Transform the American Family. Ready for that? And Nita Farhani is with us, professor of law, philosophy, genome sciences, and policy at Duke University Law School. She's a member of the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues. And I think we have a lot in front of us right here. Let's bring our listeners in, if I may. Sabre is calling from Verser, Vermont. Sabre, thanks for calling. You're on the air. Hi, Tom. Hi. Hi, Dr. Um, Shu. Uh, I find this incredibly fascinating, having read a book, also science fiction, by Nancy Kress, Beggars in Spain, uh, I guess published in 1993. Uh, it was a tri- part of a trilogy, and <clears throat> she addressed 
some of the ethical issues brought up with superior intel- intelligence um, as well. The, the people became uh, sleep, excuse me, I'm so nervous, uh, sleepless, and so they, they could um, use their superior intelligence even more rapidly uh, and mm-hmm. not having to give up any time to sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess I'm mostly fascinated not so much with, you know, whether uh, babies are made the old-fashioned way or this, but the actual um, uh, ethics and thought behind the project in China, um, because it seems like we have a lot of very smart people, many of whom are trying to enact change in society um, but don't have the power, etc. And so a lot of it has to do with... Um, access to power, and I'm just wondering if, um, I'm, getting, <laughs> I'm getting off base here, I'm, I guess I'm just wondering what the selection process is going to be, and if it's just for competitive edge, um, or will it be for humans to have uh, capability um, to create a thriving society and globe in the future, given global warming and all of the Yeah, so, Sarah, right. we've got it. I appreciate your call. Nita, I'll, I'll take it to, to China, but Nita, yeah. I'll, let me, I'll, I hear you there. First to you. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think that uh, a couple of, uh, of interesting points are raised in by the question. So first is, um, you know, are there trade offs? So anytime we have a new technology, one of the very first questions we have to ask are, what are the consequences of the use? What are the safety sure. and efficacy profile of the thing that we're actually talking about? So there are plenty well, of examples. Well, safety and efficacy would just be the be- uh, very important, but just well, the beginning. I mean, so, so equity I, I, and justice and uh, I don't know. All no, 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 of course, of course. But I mean, first you want to know how does mm-hmm. it work and what are the implications yep. of it? And then, you know, what are the broader ethical implications? Um, and when she says, you know, there's a trade-off in this book between sleeplessness and intelligence, that's one of the things that we really have to be careful of as we're talking about genetic selection is understanding the traits actually can work together. So what are the consequences for individuals if we maximize one trait while ignoring other traits? We need to understand those things. Um, but also the kind of questions about justice and equity that, you know, you point out and that the question points out, which is, you know, what happens if it's in the hands of governments? What happens if it's only available to people who are wealthy? Now, of course, that's true of nearly every enhancement that we already have with our children, education, vitamins, nutrition, even, you know, different types of mate selection that happen. But should we worry that this creates, you know, different classes of individuals? Those are questions that we have to ask. The answer to those questions um, may not be to stop such selection from happening. It may be to look at better ways to distribute the risks and benefits of the new technological advances. Steve Shu, let me put it to you. I mean, uh, here's China working on this very hard, you and your colleagues there. How do you see it uh, as uh, for just to defend the health of the child from disease or for a personal edge or for a societal improvement? After all, you've got big investment here from the Chinese government. Is there a, is there a societal imperative to step up to this technology and exercise it. I'd like to go back to the basic science for a minute and point out that the real motivation here is to understand how the genome builds the brain and understanding how particular genes influence variation in human intelligence Mm -hmm. is a clue uh, that will lead us in that direction. Mm -hmm. So we are not Uh, doing this research specifically for the goal of genetic engineering. That just happens to be one of the applications further downstream. I mean, I I take your point on that, that, but but I I have to just point back to your own website where people are talking about PGD very uh, enthusiastically and brimming with talk about future possibilities. And if I may, just just come back to the question of whether this would be for personal enhancement or societal enhancement, and does an imperative to do it develop societally or not? If, if If you succeed in understanding how the genome builds the brain. For your listeners who can't see the website that you're looking at, it's a website of a company with thousands of employees and multiple different labs. So when you talk about PGD, you're talking about a different part of the organization than the one that we're in. Um, But leaving that aside, let me just say that for people like myself who are scientists, we tend to be very sensitive to the benefits to society of scientific progress. And those of us who know the history of science know that those discoveries are often made by people of superior ability and superior intelligence. So for us, it seems quite benign to uh, increase the fraction of population that are capable of making positive scientific discoveries. Uh, In other words, to increase the portion of society with higher intelligence. Correct. 
Uh, So so just can I ask a question of that, Tom, which is, um, Steve, I assume that you're trying to understand intelligence in context and you're trying to understand different components of intelligence. So emotional intelligence, um, you know, versus rational thought intelligence. So, you know, it it seems like uh, to just say that it's important to increase the number of people who can make advances in scientific progress in society doesn't take into account the full types of intelligence that one might be interested in maximizing, as well as what the consequences might be for creativity, originality, other forms of um, intelligence or traits. Well, let me, if I may, Steve, do you buy the notion that there are different types of intelligence, or are you looking for the genes that say, no, this is intelligence, raw intelligence, and that's what we're looking to understand and maybe recreate? You're uh, asking a question that could take up uh, an entire show. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you are a psychometrician, that is a type of psychologist who studies cognitive ability, uh, what you would uh, know is that there is a general factor of intelligence that is positively correlated to all of the other sub-factors of intelligence uh, that were mentioned. And that just happens to be statistically the easiest thing for us to grab onto and use in our studies. There are other interesting things like creativity, personality traits, uh, individual sub-factors like short-term memory or mathematical ability or verbal ability. And those will all be studied eventually. It's just a question of statistical power at this time. Wow. Well, we're getting, I, I, should, I should also Lee? add, I just yeah. wanted to add to, to what Nita said and, mm-hmm. and what Steve is saying as well. In, in terms of who's going to actually control the use of this technology – um, I think most Americans would say uh, the parents should be deciding um, what child, uh, what they want to give their child, and it's perfectly normal and healthy for parents to want to um, give their child the best start in life, the healthiest start in life. And, um, you know, if there are choices to be made, um, I think the individual parents uh, are the ones who should be making those choices. I mean, well, we'll see how that unfolds. You you say that that's the way it's going to go, but just look at abortion and the gigantic debate we've had for decades over that still unresolved. Rafaela, Rafaela, calling from New Orleans. Rafaela, you're on the air. Great. Hi, Tom. Hi. Um, I actually have a question about some unforeseen repercussions that could come from this technology. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I know when you're engineering repeatedly for a certain trait, I'm sure these are traits that mo- most parents would want, things like intelligence or height, that would kind of be selected for again and again and again. You really would lose some di- um, genetic diversity in the gene pool. And I'm wondering, does that weaken the gene pool, make us more susceptible to things like disease? Or maybe we're selecting for something that we don't really realize, so certain defects that are connected to those genes. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering Good about question. those actually biological repercussions that um, we're not really thinking about here. Yeah, uh, Steve Shu, first to you on that. It's entirely possible there could be unforeseen uh, repercussions. And in fact, the early predictive models will be statistical in nature. So, you know, they, they won't always be right in predicting what will happen. Um, but... You have to remember, this is going to be rolled out in a very uh, gradual way. So first, probably some wealthy people who are really interested in this will start doing it. Maybe a few state governments will uh, encourage it, even make it part of their national health care system. But it'll be a long time before this becomes universal, and uh, it'll have effects that take place over generations. So you'll have a long period of time to test whether your models are working and whether the consequences are the ones that you wanted. A long time, but somehow I feel like I am just absolutely light speeding into the future in this country. Conversation. Anthony in Lexington, Kentucky. Anthony, you're on the air. Hi, Tom. Hi. I uh, just wanted to say that I see this as, um, first of all, I think it's culturally insensitive. I think that there's a matter of class, even the mention of um, the fact that there, um, that there would be rich people that would <laughs> receive this at, at first and yeah. would roll out to government and then further. And I think it's racist. And so I think that. Um, um, in in a real sense, this is going to this this whole technology, this whole idea of um, of uh, genetically, you know, um, altering or not just altering, but genetically producing uh, people is sick. You know, I mean, it just doesn't. To me, it is. Um, I'm not trying. I'm not trying to come from the standpoint that it's um, um, you have God and you have um, uh, science. You know, but I think that there has to be a balance. Um, and with one's um, uh, understanding of the, the cultural uh, dynamics. So I'm thinking that when you talk about what is intelligence, you yep. know, 
from one culture to another is a difference in what intelligence is. Anthony, I'm very glad you raise all of this. There's so many issues. This is an important one. Again, Steve, let me bring it to you. And I'm reading again from Wikipedia talking about BGI's work on human genetics and your Yan Huang project, saying, named after two emperors believed to have founded China's dominant ethnic group, BGI plans to sequence at least 100 Chinese individuals to produce a high-resolution map of Chinese genetic polymorphisms. The first genome sequenced is of an anonymous Chinese billionaire who donated $10 million uh, to the project. Does race come in here, Dr. Xu? It's uh, funny that you would uh, single out the Chinese for uh, racism in this I don't mean to be context. funny. I'm just looking at I, the work of your organization, BGI. So, so the reason that that particular project you described was done was because the early sequences that were done at high coverage were European, mm-hmm. and there was a need to do a Chinese sequence mm-hmm. uh, at that level of resolution. So it's also quite culturally insensitive to tell another sovereign nation what kind of research they can and cannot do. Um, there, there's no racial motivation in any of this. I think that for us, the main motivation is really to understand the human brain and how the, the human gene genome builds the human brain. I want to put some more li- listener. F- one second, Nita. Just I want to be sure we get this out there because our listeners are, are responding abundantly here. And uh, I'll get you on this, Nita. Meb says, how can you ever tell your kids about such an activity? Imagine how you'd feel if you found out your parents would have discarded you if you didn't meet their criteria. Interesting. Uh, Brett wants to bring the the the, uh, the God um, perspective in here. Let's assume Brett writes. Let's assume for the moment that God exists. Um, is this what God would want? Now, take it or leave it. But he says genetic manipulation that would make biological procreation obsolete. Brett writes, I don't think so. Lee, to your point that uh, everybody's going to be on board with this, we'll see. And Cat writes from Cat in Boston says. As if wealth inequality weren't enough of an issue already, is there any scenario in which this wouldn't drastically widen the already huge disparity between the haves and have-nots? Nita. Tom, I think it's important to to note that technology is not racist, technology is not uh, discriminatory, but human misuse of them can be. And this is a technology that enables us to do with greater precision things that we've already been doing for quite a while. We've already been doing selection. We've already been trying to do things to promote and enhance the health um, and other traits of our children. But we're talking question, scale and specificity here that outstrips anything we've done as, as we well, look into it, this future. Well, you know, if we're talking about prenatal genetic diagnosis, we're doing it already. We're doing it already for quite a few health traits. Um, and I think giving parents information to make choices, but really clear specification of what that information is. Like this is the particular type of intelligence that we're talking about. Um, you know, it may have trade-offs, it may have other consequences, enables people to make choices that make sense for their families. Now, whether or not that would lead to vast discrimination, I, I doubt it. Most of the surveys of parents and most of the parents who've used this technology so far have done it because they're interested in enhancing the health of their children and having children who look like them, not trying to select for a particularly eugenic version of what children might look like. Now, would children grow up and feel traumatized by the idea that their parents had given them health-promoting genes and had tried to give them every possible advantage in life? I think we know the answer to that question already, which is children generally don't feel slighted if their parents have given them the best possible education, the best possible opportunities to give them an opportunity to flourish. Yeah, but, but they'll also think about the ones that got away. Lee, we've just got a minute left here. Yeah. Yeah, what about I, the I national? We, I, w- I want to ask you in particular about norms that are likely to uh, uh, emerge globally here. Dr. Shu's well, working with a Chinese mm-hmm. company and at Michigan State, and he says, essentially, look, don't tell us what's right and wrong here. We'll, we'll, yeah. you know, we're going to pursue this the way we like. I think, I, I think there's an analogy here between just general health care and having children that have the best chance for health and life. A hundred years ago, the infant mortality rate was 30%. And industrialized countries have brought that down to less than one in one in a thousand, one in ten thousand. And what we're talking about here, before we get anywhere near intelligence, is parents want to have healthy children. Uh, they're going to be able to use this technology to avoid the kinds of diseases that are very common uh, in society today. Doing as that means older. not having sex to make babies. A hundred years from now, do you think sex for babies will well, be seen well, as primitive? Well, sex is already for uh, recreation. We don't usually have sex to have babies. Most people recreate through sex today. Yeah, but they don't have... 
Yes, but they don't have sex to recreate. They I just don't buy sex. that. At, oh, mostly. Okay, but I'm saying, do you think 100 years from now, will most babies come from sex or from a test tube? Uh, well, I think in, in highly industrialized countries, um, the technology is going to go forward. I don't think people are going to take the chance of having uh, uh, a child through, through sex. That's very risky. Okay, a lot on the table. My mind is officially blown today. I've got to re- rethink, <laughs> rethink everything from sex up. You all are very generous with your insights, and we're grateful for it. Uh, Lee Silver, a professor of molecular biology, public affairs at Princeton University, author of Remaking Eden. Lee, thank you for joining us today. You're very welcome. Dr. Steve Shu, who is VP for Research and Graduate Studies, Professor of Theoretical Physics at Michigan State University, and right in the middle of BGI's Cognitive Genomics Lab in China. Dr. Shu, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And Nita Farhani, Professor of Law, Philosophy, Genome Sciences, and Policy at Duke University Law School. Thank you, Nita. Good luck to us all. Thanks, Nita. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Listeners, in this hour tomorrow, we're looking at young graduates and the work they're going to do. Join us for that. I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point.